Buenas tardes. I'm very happy to, to be here at this conference. I come from the UK um, and my background is in international development with a particular focus on uh, knowledge management and the use of information and communication technologies. Um, I'm going to start actually by sort of quoting from a book that I was uh, given in 1970. I never knew it was going to come in useful, but it's called The World of Tomorrow. Um, let's see how we work this. So, um, from this book, there are a couple of quotes. Um, and this book was written, uh, as I say, nearly 50 years ago. Um, the author at the time speculated that um, in a hundred years' time, no one would use real money anymore. And he said that through special electronic walls of their houses, which are huge television sets, the people are plugged in to all the world and other parts of the solar system. The television sets, as you might expect, are three-dimensional in colour. The electronic wall also connects the set to libraries, museums and houses of friends. So, pretty uh, good predictions, maybe. Um, for the women present, I thought I would just also give you a quote as to what he said about what um, you're likely to be doing. You may or may not agree with this. When she wants to shop, she dials the store or market, and as soon as her call is answered, the store or market appears on the wall screen. She can talk to the assistants, who will show her a range of goods from clothing to the fruit brought in that day from the greenhouses in Antarctica. Mother makes all her purchases for the day, and a computer immediately ships them to her by means of underground pneumatic tubes. So there you go. That's what they thought 50 years ago. <laughs> so, um, what I want to talk about is a study. Um, if I can get this to move on. And technology is broken down. Okay. Um, so, uh, a few years ago, I was working with the International, um, sorry, uh, the Institute of Development Studies, and we put together a team uh, to do a project looking at the future of knowledge sharing in the digital age. And our focus was in particular on Africa. We spoke with a range of stakeholders, uh, from publishers, NGOs, librarians, people in the private sector, and so on. We held a number of workshops in the UK and Africa. We looked at a few key questions. Over the next 15 years, what are the implications of digital technologies for sustainable development? So it's very much kind of coincided with the period of the SDGs that we're looking at. And we also asked what kinds of decisions and actions are needed now from policymakers and practitioners to create a positive digital landscape for development. We used what's called a foresight approach, which is rather a different set of tools from normal research. Um, and basically, this involves sort of looking at the scope of the challenge, then ordering uncertainty. So trying to think about what things are uncertain in the future, and identifying implications and options for us now. So those are some of the, the range of stakeholders that we were, were talking to. We had workshops, we had uh, interviews with some experts and tried to gather a sort of wide picture of what was um, in people's minds when they think about the future. This foresight me methodology starts trying to think about what are the drivers of change, what are the things which influence change. And we looked at a range of factors. Some were social, some were technical, some economic, some environmental, and some political. And these were some of the themes that the participants in this project identified. What this led us to was to sort of create a framework for um, exploring four different scenarios. So from these drivers of change, um, a number of factors were identified and prioritized. And in particular, we looked at um, four different scenarios which varied in relation to the uh, resources and the abundance of resources available and how open or closed knowledge might be. The idea of these scenarios was to create stories, so it involved quite a lot of creativity and asking people to use their imagination about the future 
Um, there is a report where you can read the stories if you'd like to. Um, there's a link at the end um, which I can give you. But the first scenario uh, was one which we called regulated abundance. And um, this was a world where assets are abundant and relatively dispersed ownership. Where knowledge is openly available, but where regulation and surveillance are sort of pervasive. So some of the key characteristics that were thought around this um, are listed there. I won't sort of read through them all in the interest of time, but I just want to highlight a few things in each scenario. So we see lots of data being produced here, information being open to all, and machines are guiding regulation and policy. There were some quotes from the stories, which I've just drawn out, which I think sort of highlight where innovation and technology comes in. So um, one of the participants was saying, in this scenario, all our algorithms are so good that they get together and make their own new algorithms without us. So the machines by 2030 are doing all this for us. Our data science has got that good. <laughs> the second scenario um, highlighted, called the, the good, the bad and the ugly, so there's some positives and negatives about this one. This highlights a world of freely available knowledge, but in a context where many assets are scarce and ownership of these assets is relatively concentrated. Maybe you recognize this scenario. <laughs> um, so here, we've got high levels of inequality, but knowledge is widely available, but skills and abilities are, are not there for most people to make good use of it. A quote from the bottom, people's ability to identify what they need and conduct crowdfunding exercises to try to get it is, is a positive side uh, of the open knowledge that is available. But these efforts are, are rarely successful. So in this scenario, people have uh, some skills, but um, the efforts they have are, are rarely successful because um, the assets are very concentrated. Try and think as I present these scenarios as to what the sort of library response should be because in the context of this conference what I want to say is innovation and knowledge are not neutral. Some of the choices we make can influence and shape um, the scenario that will unfold in our countries in the future. The third scenario, ignorance is bliss, is a world of resource scarcity and concentrated ownership where access to knowledge is tightly managed and controlled. So here we've got a stratified society with a small elite uh, and everyone else. And only government approved information and knowledge are available. One of the characters from the story we developed here, uh, Bibi, says that she prefers to get her information from an underground knowledge network. These are informal and uncontrolled although some are assisted by, I was going to say, enlightened librarians who try to curate and preserve community knowledge. So different types of roles for librarians in these different scenarios. And, uh, yeah, oh, that's a good one. There we go. Oops, going too fast. And the fourth and final one, digital dam busters. A world that combines tight management and control of knowledge with abundant assets, with ownership distributed relatively widely. So here data is abundant, but only elites have the tools to analyze and use it. Innovation, <coughs> largely crowdsourced and automated. Uh, some of you may be familiar with massive open online courses, MOOCs. Um, in this context, we're imagining these in 15 years time, having turned into global online education delivery and tracking environments. Uh, which all but the elite must subscribe to. So we all become part of maybe Google University or, or something, but we're, we're tracked. Um, so I don't know, I was going to have a vote and see which scenario you prefer, but maybe the time is, <laughs> is not sufficient. Um, the idea of this research was to create these scenarios um, and then out of thinking about them, try and think, actually, what sort of world do we want to see? What is a preferred scenario for us? And how might we achieve that? Um, so, some of the things that we thought about in this uh, research exercise were about the kind of future we prefer. 
And the key characteristics that were, that were highlighted by participants were as follows. Internet access is universal and considered a right. Information is abundant and available. Better tools and cooperation have resulted in more research. Crowdsourcing helps with service delivery and government accountability. And there's a balance to be had between openness and privacy. So, having developed these scenarios, we, we, we then looked at a range of um, things to do with technology and knowledge and tried to think about um, over the next 15 years, how will they influence us? If I go back to um, the guy who wrote this book, he said that we should be cautious about predictions because they'll always be limited by our imagination and that the future will be shaped by many inventions that have not been thought of yet. So over the next 15 years, some of the things that we'll come across um, may be things that we haven't thought about at all um, as yet. Um, but clearly we're already in a world where um, more of the communication on the internet is now between, between machines than it is between human beings. And by 2020 it's thought that 50 billion to 100 billion devices will be connected to the internet. And there will be a mix of communication between people to people, people to device, and device to device. But most communication will be between machines. We're already seeing examples with driverless cars and intelligent devices being more evident. Uh, so data science is taking us that way. And um, to quote from people called Pepper and Garrity, data growth is rocketing over 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created each day, and 90% of the world's stored data was created in the last two years alone. So we're kind of entering into an era where the amount of data around us is huge, and the knowledge curation that will be required uh, will require um, curation activities not just between people, uh, but between people and machines, and maybe even helping machines to communicate with machines and find the right data that that they need to update themselves. So uh, in a world where the technology and innovation is just moving so fast, um, how do we respond to that? Um, in talking with the participants in this study, they identified a range of technology trends. I'm just going to pause so you can have a, a, a quick look at that. Um, some of these trends will be relevant, more relevant perhaps to knowledge management um, than others. But I think we're already aware around us of the influence of social networks and big data uh, and cloud computing. <coughs> Similarly, uh, knowledge trends. And um, I'd like to actually go back to a quote I meant to uh, share from one of the participants of the study at the beginning, who said, knowledge is going to be the new inequality. Where does it fit in the sustainable development goals? So as we think about all these knowledge trends, we need to think about the issues around equity and inclusiveness and um, consider as we think about uh, technologies and the way knowledge is managed and shared um, as to how we can um, promote inclusion and it was good to hear a focus on digital literacy early on. Um, we're also seeing a sort of move as technology influences uh, things towards social digital libraries and um, our study suggests that libraries will need to manage some of these major shifts, not just from print to digital, but from pre-designed to personalised collections, from owning to renting, from desktop to mobile, from archiving to publishing, and, and from the hard drive to the cloud. So the digital context is changing the orientation of the library, and some of the shifts um, I think are, are highlighted there for you. Library roles in the digital age, uh, again I'm not going to read through that um, table, um, but just to highlight from Kenan and Wilson, that in the paper paradigm the library was a building holding tangible items such as books and journals. In the new paradigm libraries provide an invisible infrastructure to enable the provision of information to inform the search. Um, but when knowledge needs can be fulfilled online, uh, the increasingly relevant skills that go into curating materials make them invisible, making them, in, making them visible and helping people 
to find what they need become largely invisible. So the actual need for librarians is greater, but the visibility of them uh, is less. Uh, and the public perception may be that information intermediaries and professionals are less needed, whereas the opposite is true. And we need to get that message clearly across to uh, policy makers. Um, I think we're all pretty aware of the changing behaviours of library users, uh, but this was also very much highlighted in the study. They demand 24-7 access, instant gratification of the click, like I'm <laughs> yeah. And they're increasingly looking for the answer, rather than a particular form, uh, format of uh, the search monograph or journal, journal article. So they're not so interested in what kind of thing it is, they just want the answer to the questions. So they can scan, flick and power, bro power browse their way through digital content. Um, but, as I'm sure most of us would recognise, the search engine's results are only as good as the content that, that's indexed. And um, there's certainly scepticism amongst people we spoke to uh, about the uh, usefulness of some of the search tools. Uh, there was a sense that the Google searches are not delivering innovative things, but they're giving you what it thinks you need to know. So how do we get beyond that? Um, and we're beginning to find more of these sort of tools also being used in libraries, and they may actually narrow what we can find rather than expand our horizons. Um, Fisher, in an article in 2014, said that discovery tools are putting too high a value on volume of information and too little on curation. So we need to focus on not the quantity of stuff we can find, but the quality of how we find it and how we, how we curate it. Um, moving towards the end, I want to link what I've been saying a little bit to uh, pedagogy. Um, it's not easy to make this link. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's a challenge for libraries and librarians to become visible and valued. Um, and um, to do this in a way that doesn't disrupt the easy access to resources that uh, users want. In the four scenarios I highlighted, the pedagogy that's kind of relevant to them uh, obviously differs quite a lot. Um, they, uh, some are much more open than others. Uh, some see a society where some knowledge is more valued uh, and comes available to a few and at a premium price. So in Open Access Week it's good to, to stress the value of trying to get that um, high premium knowledge out there openly and freely as well as the low cost stuff. So on the surface maybe there's a access to a greater pool of knowledge and scope for pedagogical innovation through uh, drawing on social networks in education, through crowdsourcing and use of open approaches. Um, there'll be more scope for collaboration and constructing knowledge in new ways. But the librarian will have to help, help those in education to navigate this landscape and to try and ensure that all users, including the poor, have the digital literacy skills and can freely access uh, relevant knowledge and data sets for them. So librarians will be increasingly needing to be skillful knowledge creators and I would also think uh, they need to be advocates as they are at the moment for uh, free access to, to knowledge. Um, so my final thoughts are really just to uh, highlight some of the conclusions that came out from this study. Um, the preferred scenario for the future that we came up with uh, looked like uh, the points that are listed there. Promoting equitable access to relevant knowledge, widening availability of knowledge, supporting the creation of a diverse uh, knowledge pool, providing uncensored and free access to knowledge, and supporting an appropriate level of regulation to protect uh, privacy and to enable innovation to flourish. So this is an agenda which I hope uh, receives um, the support of the people at this conference and also will sort of give context to some of the discussions we're having. Uh, thank you very much.